CEO of the Knoxville Area Urban League, and I am absolutely delighted to be involved uh, again in uh, the diversity week that is, uh, that is implemented from the College of Information Science and Communications. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, today's panel discussion is very rich, and so rather than go through a wealth of uh, introductions, we're going to jump right into it because we want to leave time for your interaction. Uh, our panelists uh, are here, and we're going to quickly go down, let them introduce themselves, and just so that you know the panel. Uh, other information is in the uh, in in the brochure, but we want to uh, maximize our time by getting to the topic about unifying and transforming our community. To my left is. Hi, folks. <laughs> I'm not Jamie Satterfield. Right. It was, it was on. Um, I'm not Jamie Satterfield. My name's Mike Martinez. I'm a, here comes my name tag. Uh, <laughs> I'm an assistant professor here in the School of Journalism and Electronic Media. Uh, and I, before coming uh, to the academy, I was a working journalist for 26 years. Um, probably most prominently at the Associated Press in New York. do that one more time. So I'm Troy Lane and I'm the Chief of Police here at the University of Tennessee. I'm Thomas Cortez. I am a first year council member here at the University of Tennessee as well as a diversity affairs member. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, unifying and transforming our community post-Ferguson. Post-Ferguson. So just to lay a little groundwork, uh, we had uh, not only Ferguson, but we had Baltimore, we had Long Island, but it really began in Sanford, Florida with Trayvon Martin. If it had been an isolated incident, we would not be talking about a post-Ferguson era. So that's just to say uh, how the foundation of today's um, topic was, uh, was developed. So what what has changed since uh, this new awareness across our country uh, uh, about incidents, uh, police reaction, citizen reaction, and how successful has the UT Police Department been in building better relationships uh, with a, a diverse community? And we'll address that to, our, our, to Troy. Uh, we have the luxury because we have a fairly large department for uh, our campus size. So I, I came from another campus that was roughly the same size as UT but had uh, less than half of the staff that I have. So we have the luxury of having uh, extra people to address certain issues. So for instance, our community relations unit, which does a lot of our programming, they're probably the, the, the public face of our department. Uh, those are the folks that are really uh, that we give the charge to to communicate with the community, uh, whether that be through training or just talking about the police department. We have a program we call UTPD 101, which is just kind of what do we do? Uh, how do we involve ourselves in the community? How do we police? Uh, which which I consider much different than most municipal police departments. Um, I came from a municipal background uh, 20 some years ago. I was a city police officer, uh, went to the campus actually to finish my degree and, and work at the same time. The, the thing that kept me on a campus was the interaction that we have. Uh, for a long time in law enforcement, we've talked about this concept of community policing. And I think campus police departments in particular really personify community policing. We are a part of this community. Uh, we consider you a part of our community. And even though our community is pretty transient. Every four years we have, every year literally, we have a new group of people that come in. Uh, but, but we make all the efforts we can to communicate with the community uh, and really work positively with them. So we hear that term a lot about community 
policing. I don't really know what that means, and maybe somebody else might have heard that term. Could you sort of, you know, explain that to us so that we can understand that term? Right. So I, I think if we all think back to the history of, of, of our nation uh, and law enforcement as it interacted with, with our communities, many years ago we didn't have police cars. Uh, everybody was on a beat walking, uh, walking the streets of their community. Uh, and typically, uh, even when I was in a city, I was typically assigned to the same beat every night. And the philosophy was that I got to know the community members in my area. Uh, I, I didn't just drive by, see them. I actually knew them. But in a lot of larger communities, uh, we, we just simply, the, the call volume is, is such that we simply don't have the time to get out and walk and talk to people and get to know them very well. Now, some of that, quite honestly, uh, is on us in law enforcement because we don't take the time to do that. Uh, and then other times, in all honesty, they just don't have the time. But the philosophy behind community policing is just that, is to get out of the car, to actually get to know the community that you work with, get to know the people. We, we can't influence. You can try as much as you can to influence change in your community from a law enforcement perspective through enforcement. And, and that, that's a very important key uh, or, or portion of changing uh, behaviors or, or uh, bad things that are going on in your community, but it's not the only thing. Uh, addressing community leaders, parents, uh, members of the community that have influence, uh, those are all very important. And that's really the philosophy behind community policing, is to involve the community and in, in not just strictly enforce. Uh, we anticipate having another panel member that influences our questions here, but we're going to use you to help us bridge that gap. With, um, how does the UT police work with Knox KPD because so many of our students do not live on campus? And uh, I think it's uh, very important and informative them Formative for them to understand the relationship between the two. Right. So that campus police and city police uh, communication or, or connection is really, I think, very dependent on the leaders in each department. Um, I see examples. I communicate a lot with campus law enforcement leaders across the country. I'm a board member for our association. Uh, we have a good relationship here, but that's not the same everywhere. In some places, they barely communicate, uh, or if they do at all. Um, Chief Roush and I, uh, believe it or not, 28, 30 years ago, something like that, were actually stationed together in the Army, um, you know, several states away from here. So we have that background. We've, we've become good friends. We communicate often. Uh, that's, that's really key to having a good relationship. Beyond that, uh, from a legal standpoint, the state statute very much influences our jurisdiction. Um, we have an MOU with the city that incorporates the Fort Sanders community as part of our jurisdiction because we realize they're our neighbors to the north. And, and a lot of you probably live there. Uh, so we share jurisdiction in that area. Uh, beyond that, my officers attend their comp stat meetings. That's the comparative statistics meetings they have where they kind of track crime and trends. Uh, we attend those. Uh, we meet probably weekly for a variety of subjects. It could be, you know, the next football game. Here's the things we need to do for that. Uh, it could be a, a crime issue that we're seeing uh, and, and pooling our resources to address that issue. Uh, but we, we communicate often, and I think that's really key to good relations between the departments. They, uh, they understand uh, typically when we have a large scale event off of the campus that, that involves a lot of our students, they, they, they realize that it's very important to involve us in that communication so that we can ad help address those issues. So uh, I'm, I'm going to stay with you, uh, Chief, because these are some critical uh, questions uh, for not only for our students, but for all of our citizens. Technology has changed the way that we interact with, uh, with our police officers. Uh, how has that helped, how has technology helped in law enforcement? 
and what are any of the hindrances that technology has brought to bear on your force? Technology is something that, so it'd be very difficult for us not to be uh, tech savvy in, in my line of work and be successful at this point. Uh, everything from the crime reports that we write that are entered into a database that collects that information and, and plots crime trends and statistics across the campus or even in the Fort Sanders area because we work there. Um, radio communications, technology is huge. Um, if it's hindered us at all, uh, it, it may at times tend to take us away from that face-to-face -face contact that we might otherwise have. Uh, it's easy to go call to call and enter your information in a laptop computer in the car and it shoots it back to the central mainframe back at the police department and we lose, we lose sight of that communication or, or interaction with the community. Um, but I, in many ways it's helped um, tremendously. Uh, anything from, so we're an accredited agency. Uh, there's a, roughly 1,200 campus police departments in the country. Uh, I think at last count there were only about 60 of us that were actually accredited agencies. Um, it helps us track trends as far as uh, one of the questions I saw uh, that was sent to me was uh, dealing with officer stress and early warning, if you will. <clears throat> so one of the things that we can do is pull up say use of force uh, and see if there's any trend in, in our use of force. Is it something that we need to train better or uh, you know, do we have a higher volume of, of certain activities that are leading to that? Uh, but certainly those, the system like the system that we just purchased and, and are actually installing now for our records management system will actually fl flag activity like that to let us know this is something you should look at. There may be nothing to it, but it's something you should take a look at and we can go back and, and do that. Now, we talked about uh, technology on your side. Let's talk about technology on our, on our side as, as citizens. <laughs> um, we know that a lot of what was reported was recorded. Uh, what it, what's our right in the use of a cell phone and uh, those kinds of things when in an interaction with law enforcement? So let me give you a little unique perspective from me. Um, all of us kind of find specialties in our career, uh, whether that's, you know, you may be a specialist in crime scene or traffic accident reconstruction, something like that. One of the things that I inherited and, and actually learned to enjoy greatly over the years is I've been an, uh, an ethics instructor for law enforcement for about 15 years now. Um, we have this thing that I call the ethical dilemma test, which is a series of questions that I ask my officers to ask themselves when they're interacting with someone. Uh, one of the things, one of the questions that they often ask is, would I be doing what I'm doing right now if someone had a camera in my face? Um, so they should expect that. And when I deliver that ethics training to my officers annually, one of the things I remind them is, Every, probably every person that you're going to encounter on a college campus has got a cell phone, and it probably has a camera on it. So you should expect that you're going to be filmed. Uh, don't, you know, you don't need to be angry about it. You know, we, we wear the body cameras now, and we utilize them. I, I tell those guys, anytime you're interacting with somebody, you need to turn it on. Now, if I jump out of the car to say hello to you, I'm not going to turn on my camera. But if, if I'm, if I'm going to talk to you about something, an enforcement action, or you've called me to report something, that should be turned on. And that protects you and it protects me. Uh, so they should expect that. I think our officers in particular, and I, I think most police departments have become pretty savvy to the fact that there's a lot of cameras out there. And particularly when we get involved in, in large-scale incidents, riots, or, or you know, uh, any kind of public displays, you, you, I mean, it should go without saying that someone there has a camera, so. Okay, so you get all the police questions. We do have questions for other members of the panel, but we were gonna have two, so you get them all. So, I'm riding along with a couple of my colleagues and we're stopped by law enforcement. What should we do to avoid a, tra a tragic or near tragic incident? What is it? How should we respond 
And also, what should we expect from law enforcement? So I've been pulled over. Um, I've had a ticket. It was a long time ago, but it's happened. Uh, my wife tells me now that I drive like an old man, and I probably do. Um, I know from that perspective that my first reaction when I got pulled over is, what did I do? And, and I, I know, that too, that I was somewhat angry. It's not, it's not a fun feeling to be pulled over. Your, your instant questions are, what did I do wrong? Why is this guy stopping me? You know, and and you're, you're probably a little amped up. And we see that quite often. I've, I've been on the streets. I see that quite often. The initial reaction from the person is, is just that. Uh, that should be understandable. Um, the, the, the key, I think, is to be cooperative. You can, you can ask, what, what did you stop me for? That's a perfectly legitimate question, and I think all of us that wear a badge should expect that question. Uh, so th that, that's to be expected. You can, you can plead your case. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, where it starts to cross the line is when, when you let that anger take control of you um, on either side, whether it's the guy with the badge or the person in the car. Um, I try not to let other people dictate my feelings. If I allow you to anger me, then I've allowed you to somehow influence control over me. And so I, I and, and maybe some of that comes with maturity. You know, some of the officers that you'll meet on the street are 21, 22, 23 years old, don't have a lot of life experience don't yet know how to step back and, and not let someone else control their feelings, uh, but certainly ask those questions. At the end of the day, if you have a complaint, if, if you believe that the officer was wrong or that, that they profiled you because of the color of your skin or whatever, uh, luckily, I, I believe that, that we're fortunate to live in a community where Knoxville Police Department UTPD are accredited agencies, and I, I keep saying that, but, but one of the reasons I say that is because a lot of the places that we've seen these issues, particularly where the federal government has come in and provided oversight and recommendations moving forward, one of the things that they routinely recommend is that those agencies become accredited. And there's a reason for that, because we have a lot of checks and balances in place to deal with issues just like that. So when a complaint comes into my department based on race or any other you know, sexism, it doesn't matter what the complaint is, it's thoroughly investigated and goes through at least a three-step review before it, we render any decision. Uh, we are required to take action on that. If we didn't, we wouldn't maintain our, our certification or our accreditation. Uh, so that's, that, to me, I believe is the way, at least in this community, to, to address that issue, and I think really in every community, allow us the opportunity to address the issue ourselves, because I will communicate with the person that made the complaint and, and let them know, hey, I, I don't see any basis for your complaint, or you're correct, we have an issue, we're addressing it, and here's how. Whether that's through formal discipline, whether that's through retraining, whether that's through suspension, demotion, firing, it doesn't matter but we're forced to address those issues or we can't maintain that accreditation. Okay. Well, I'm going to pause and I'm going to uh, see if there are any questions about being stopped or what you're, what you're allowed or not allowed to do. D does anybody have a question at this point? Okay. You were talking about procedures. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. bought a system that tracks the use of force throughout his time since he was born. How, like, what is it? So, essentially we've been doing that all along just through, you know, handwriting. Uh, anytime an officer uses any force on our campus, uh, in our department, because of our accreditation, because of our policies and standards, uh, we're required to, to complete a use of force report. That use of force report is, is forwarded to our internal affairs investigator who will review what's written by the officer, review the report, if any, that's uh, 
that goes along with that use of force incident, and then hopefully reviews any video that goes along with that. And they, they apply the legal standards for use of force to that situation and determine whether or not that force was excessive or in most cases, thankfully for me, not. Uh, then they forward that report. Well, the report initially goes to the supervisor, then to the internal affairs investigator, and then if they deem that it's okay, it's forwarded to me for a final review, and then I either sign off on it or we take action on it. Now, the, so the, as far as technology, all that will be now done, and when we start with our new system, will be done electronically. Uh, and I'll be able to go back, more importantly for me as, a, as an administrator, I'll be able to go back and, and perform a specific query on use of force. And it'll pull up every use of force incident we've had that we've entered into that system and then provide trends. Uh, maybe I've got a particular officer that while I have not deemed any use of force uh, inappropriate, still why that officer, why does that officer have eight use of forces, even if they've all been deemed appropriate, and the next officer maybe he's had four. Is there an issue? Uh, the, what I tend to see most of the time is it's it, all it takes is an adjustment in that officer's attitude, and suddenly those use of forces go down. I, I'm going to tell you a little story that goes along with use of force. I, I apologize, but I, I, I'd meant to say this. So many years ago, I worked on a sheriff's department, and and uh, I had an, a fellow officer named Ted. I'm just going to call him Ted. That was his name. Um, <laughs> Ted was one of these guys that literally was always embroiled in use of force, lots of arrests, things like that. Every time that I would go to a situation and Ted would show up, it would go from bad to worse like that. Every time. I could be on a simple traffic stop, he would approach, and the person would just turn hostile. I would go to a domestic violence, the, the, the last and final straw was a domestic violence situation that I went to, and, and it was a big county, small department, so we didn't have a lot of backup. I went there, husband and wife are physically into it. I'm able to de-escalate to a point where they're both talking. Ted walks in, and we end up, you know, with both of these people on the ground in handcuffs because it gets out of hand real quick. The undersheriff showed up, and I told the undersheriff, and I'll save you the colorful language, I don't want him to come to another call I'm on ever unless, I'm, unless someone's shooting at me, tell him to stay the hell away from me because every time he shows up, things go from bad to worse. It was his attitude. He was one of those people, and we've met them all, We've, I'm sorry, we've all met them, that just had a way of getting under your skin and, and making you mad. And uh, he had no business in, in, in my line of work. And, and shortly thereafter, the sheriff realized that and, and let him go. We do occasionally find those people in law enforcement that really have no business in the job. Are there any other questions that you'd want to direct? Yes. You've mentioned accreditation several times. What does that entail, and what does it mean for the department? So many years ago, CALEA, which is the Commission for Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, was formed with the idea that there should be nationwide standards for law enforcement that tell us how to do an internal affairs investigation, how to follow through on that, how to track crimes, how to, how to conduct a traffic stop, everything you can think of. So accreditation is a set of 484 standards. We're, we're, we have advanced law enforcement accreditation for UT police and Knoxville police. 440, 484 uh, individual standards for law enforcement to conduct our jobs, which equal a policy manual that's probably 500 pages long. I've had policy manuals in the past, but they're only worth the paper they're written on, really unless you can show that you're specifically adhering to those. And that's what we call proofs. So in addition to the 484 standards that we have to write our policy to mirror, we also have to continuously show proofs for each of those standards. Now some standards are an annual proof. This, me sitting here right now is a proof because one of the, one of the, one of the standards is that we have to do community outreach. 
So I'm here. This is a proof. My officers are standing in the back of the, uh, taking pictures, <laughs> and, and that'll go in our, our proof file for, for uh, our accreditation. Uh, standards for how we conduct internal investigations, standards for everything you can think of, all require specific proofs. At the end of a three-year period, CALEA picks assessors, which are generally uh, uh, accreditation managers for other departments, and they come here, and they'll spend about a week here. They were just here last March. They review all those files <coughs> and determine if the proofs are correct, and then they conduct sessions with the public like this. We, we had ours uh, uh, at the, the old student union before they tore it down. And they allow members of the public to come in and provide public comment. Uh, they take phone calls, emails, letters, etc. At the end of the process, they decide whether or not you're meeting those standards. And there's some variance. I mean, you're allowed to get away with not meeting one or two. Uh, as long as you're making an attempt to, they, they may see a standard a little differently than we see it and say, you know, you need to adjust this policy because we don't really feel it meets this standard. But for the most part, they go through all that, and at the end of it, if they feel that you're, you're, you're still meeting your standards. Uh, so in, in July, I went out to uh, Colorado Springs and accepted our second reaccreditation for the department. I'll add that there's also a, an IACLEA, that's the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators, that's the board, I'm on the board there. Uh, they also have an accreditation that's specific to campus law enforcement, which involves about another 80 standards. We, we also have that accreditation, and we're adding the Tennessee Association of Chiefs of Police accreditation. Uh, we hope to have that in place by the end of this year. And all those are very similar. They involve assessment, on-sites, uh, feedback, so forth, and, and we have to show proof that we're meeting the standard. So you've gotten a, a little more insight into a campus police from uh, the purview of the captain there. Uh, all right, let's turn, let's turn to the student. Um, Thomas, uh, as a UT student, what do you think needs to be done to uh, better the relationship between students and the department? I believe not even just as a UT student, but as a citizen in general, the way we can better build a relationship with the police department in our community is to begin starting a dialogue. I think that the best way to do that is to have venues such as this or also like a one-on-one -on -one type of uh, conversation with police, such as uh, if there's one type of community policing, such as he talked about, where you can do coffee with a cop. And that lets you sit down with, a cop, sit down with an officer and discuss what you believe the best way to handle the community as a whole is, the best way you believe officers can fix issues if you have any issues, if you have any gratitudes that you'd like to discuss with the officer, the way they can better perform their jobs and better make you a happier citizen. Um, also, uh, one of the biggest issues on this campus is that students don't feel like they're getting a say in what's happening. Like they don't feel like they're getting a say with important administrators or other members of the student body itself. And I feel like opening up the police department for a better dialogue will help improve students' attitudes as well as humanize people they have been nervous about since they've seen new incidents about Ferguson or New York. Um, I also believe that, uh, using an example from my own life, my, well, I have a really good friend who works at a restaurant, and uh, that restaurant stays open late. And this is a restaurant that's in my hometown of Murfreesboro. In Murfreesboro, if a, uh, restaurant is open late, an officer is stationed there to make sure that the people are protected. Well, since this officer has been stationed there, he's been there for over a year now, he's developed a relationship with the staff and all of the members of the uh, people who work there, the staff and the managers, and has developed a friendlier relationship. So as well as being respected and understood that he is there to be protected, like to protect him, uh, he is also looked at as a friend and someone that they can talk to and someone whose presence is accepted graciously as opposed to with a little bit of nervousness. So I think if we open up more of a dialogue so that we can see police as more of people as opposed to just gun-toting patrolmen, I think it would be extremely beneficial to the community as a whole as well as UT. So I'm gonna throw a, a, a question off script. This, who has ever had a very positive interaction with campus police? Positive, raise your hand, let me see. 
a very positive. Would anybody like to share a positive interaction? Okay, this is Dr. Linder. Um, Chief Lane came out to hey, Okay. Chief Lane came out um, along with his other officers to have this open dialogue and discussion with students here on campus. So it was a very, very positive experience because we got to get to know them as people and they even got to know us too. But the problem is, you know, if we want to have this dialogue, students have to show up. Only about three students were there and the police officers outnumbered us. And so in order for them to like meet us, we have to also meet them halfway too. It's our responsibility to show up and be present and to engage in that dialogue. I mean, because that was pretty much the first time that I even, as a student here, I'm a senior, um, got to sit down and talk to police officers. Like, they took the time out of their day to come out and be with us and, like, share their stories. And nobody was there except about four students. And it was publicized, like, great, in my opinion. But I feel like we also, like, have to show up in order to have those positive experiences that are not just being stopped, pulled over, or um, helping us jump off our cars, or even um, wa walking us to our cars after like dark here on campus. Yep. Got time for one more positive, positive. Anybody wanna share? Okay, I just also wanna say that being a member in this community, UT College Communication Information, we've asked um, our captain, Troy Lane, to come to sit in on a panel like this for our CCI Diversity Student Leader Society. And yes, group of students did come. Again, students got to be active, but he was there, and this was right after Ferguson happened. And also, he's been so gracious to extend his fellow police officers into the community, some of the different programs that I've been involved with. So not only here, but off campus. Okay, well, let's talk about, <clears throat> we're going to shift our, 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 our discussion now to the media. And we know that uh, social media escalated the stories of Ferguson, Baltimore, uh, Long Island, and Sanford, Florida in a way that we have never seen before. You and I saw it uh, right there in front of us on our phones. We were able to see videos. We were able to see it all. So I am turning to, to you, Mike, to talk about uh, what, how does a journalist remain objective in these high profile, high, uh, uh, very highly charged, highly charged uh, incidents? Um, well, you have to do it on the fly, which is part of it. Part of it. Is that on? Yeah, you have to do it on the fly, which is part of it. But you have to try to remain as balanced as you can. Um, as far as reporting what unfolds in front of you. And many times, unfortunately, you know, you're, you may be an individual in a one narrow area and there may be something else going on elsewhere. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you do the best you can and you update as you go. Um, the other thing is, and a lot of the criticism is, why are you trying to do this in real time? You know, why don't you wait? Put it in context, and you know, report it two hours later or or six hours later. Well, uh, first of all, we live in a real time world. Um, there, there's no way of getting around that. The best you can do is follow good journalistic principles um, that hopefully you have learned, um, um, you know, as a working journalist, as opposed to uh, a, a citizen just shooting from the hip, if you will. Now. One of the things I want to kind of talk about, particularly in the area of Ferguson, is uh, many members of the media were arrested and held and, and uh, unconstitutionally, quite honestly, held. And ultimately, when the verdict came down, uh, several members of the media went to the courts to get an injunction to prevent it from happening again. So the question, you know, the question is how, at what point, um, can you cover something in real time and yet not be prevented from co covering something in real time? So how has um, the uh, uh, citizens in use of their technology, mm -hmm. and, and we spoke about social media, how does that help or impede uh, uh, journalists uh, uh, and reporters to do their work? 
Well, it can help in a sense that there are more eyes out there. You know, as I mentioned, if, if it's an individual journalist in a certain area, he only gets, he or she only gets one view of it. But when you start seeing this spread across many different parts of an event, um, it, it reinforces it. It ultimately ends up being multiple sources, which um, either helps or hurts, depending on, on you know, what is revealed. Um, another incident just recently, which it, it wasn't racially motivated at all, but the shootings in Virginia of the two uh, uh, members of the media, uh, two uh, reporters from the BBC came upon the, the shooter who committed suicide, and the, the state troopers, I think they were, stopped them and, and asked them to delete their images. Um, you know, that's, that's starting to impinge on the ability to report what's going on. So uh, one of the questions that we were going to ask Jamie, and I'm going to ask it to you anyway because you have your, your, your wealth in this industry, uh, in your body of work, is how does one who is covering a high-profile trial remain objective? How do you keep your personal biases from coming in? Well, you remain objective by reporting what is what it comes from the witness stand. You don't, um, I don't know how else to describe this, you don't let the proponents of both sides influence your discussion. Um, there's a, 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 as long as what you, what you report is what took place in the courts, that is about as fair and balanced as you can get, as opposed to somebody's opinion and sharing that, because it comes with a bias. I've always had a question of why a news story had to uh, contain certain uh, uh, personal or certain descriptives about people who are on trial. As we had something here about the school bus um, incident, and uh, they described he was talking to a prostitute. Uh, did it really matter that the the point was that this individual was talking and texting, which caused the caused the accident? But the fact that the person on the other end was a known prostitute seemed to sensationalize the story when, when the real fact was. And so what is the accountability, the responsibility of, the, of, of people to, uh, we, we often hear so-and-so was in a LGBT known uh, area or, or, so we add these descriptors sure. uh, to sensationalize it or uh, uh, we also know in reporting if it bleeds, it leads. Meaning that, you know, uh, the more sensational it is, we want to get it to top of fold because that's the sure. part that people see. But isn't there a responsibility to not only report the facts, but not color, influence uh, uh, those facts? Yes, yes, there is a responsibility to do that. And the challenge is trying to, the journalistic principles that we teach. Um, for students becoming reporters is the only time you put a descriptor in there is when you can justify that it makes a difference. And, and that's the challenge. How do you determine when it makes a difference and when it doesn't? It used to be um, that, you know, you'd look at arrest reports or something, you know, incident reports and things like that, and you would report if it was a, a Caucasian, you didn't report the race. Right. If it was an African American, right off the bat, you reported the race. That that used to be the way that it was, um, and oh, gosh, I'm, and still I'm, is in some places. It is. We, we can't say sure. that we've erased that. No, absolutely. Um, but about I would say about fifteen twenty years ago, the journalistic practices um, by the the journalism associations uh, started arguing and making the point that unless there's a reason. Um, for example, if you're looking for, if somebody's still at large and you need to describe them or something along those lines, um, otherwise there's no point in it, you know, differentiating a, 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 among race or <laughs> ethnicity or whatever. 
So that, uh, how does, I, I'm going to, uh, we're going to come back, come back to you. I want to introduce uh, uh, Deputy Chief, I think you're, I'm calling that, Deputy Chief Nate Allen, who is with the Knoxville Police Department. Uh, I've known um, uh, Nate for a long time, and, one of, and he's done a lot of uh, great police work, but we talked about community policing, and I think he's leading by example now by going around and really giving workshops on what to do. So I, we're going to, we, uh, we had Chief Troy, I'm sorry, I called you Captain a while ago. I know you got promoted. I know you got promoted. So Chief Troy, I'm sorry about that. But uh, he answered a couple of questions that we would have addressed to you. But since you have developed this uh, this uh, presentation that you are going around, and uh, I think you 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 probably um, are, are are on a speakers bureau now because everybody is saying you need to hear what the deputy chief is saying. So if you could give us uh, uh, you know the elevator speech on what to do when stopped by an officer. Well, thank you, thank you for allowing me to be here. First of all, and I apologize for being late. A little mix up on my on my schedule, but but I'm here now, <laughs> thanks to Chief Lane, and I really appreciate being here. One of the things that the, the primary thing that I that I encourage young folks to do, or any folks when they stop by the police officer, is first of all do what you're asked to do. Your primary function, your primary goal is to do what? Is to go home at the end of the stop. Go home, and and I, I use this this term loosely, but you want to go home with the same number of holes in you that you started with. <laughs> And, and I think you all understand that very well. Uh, you want to go home. And so do you lose some dignity sometime? Yes. Do we have some bad police officers out there who, who may say things to you that's incorrect? Yes, that could happen. But what's your primary goal? It's to go home. If he's, he or she's going to give you a citation, fine. Give me the citation. My goal is to go home. Do you want to go to jail? No. Primary, um, the primary reason people get arrested or get citation is because of usually their verbal communication to and from the police officer. Don't matter if the police officer is right or wrong, it's not our place to argue with the police officer on the side of the road. Our place to argue with police officer is where? In the courtroom. Remember everything about the stop, remember everything that you did, remember everything about the police officer. What was on his patch, his or her patch on the side, what's on their badge, what's their name. I mean, you're asking for the name, and the name's right here on my, on my shoulder, on my, on my um, chest. You don't have to ask. Just look at it. The name will also be on the citation that I give you. You, also, you have the right to say, officer, what did you stop me for? He or she should explain to you the reason for the stop. If I stop you for doing 55 in a 45 zone, I should tell you that. If I stop you for no brake light, I should tell you that too. I should introduce myself to you and tell you who I am and tell you what agencies I'm, I'm with. If they don't do that, it's not your place to argue with me. You keep, the, keep a mental note. When you get done with the, with the stop, write down what you saw, what you observed, and what happened. Why? Because the mind fails you. When you get under stress in courtrooms, what do you do? You start losing your, your train of thought and forgetting things. Write down, take down notes. Now remember, when you go to court, you want to be completely right. If I wrote you for doing 65 in a 55, and you say you wasn't doing 65, you were only doing 60, are you still speeding? <laughs> yes. So be right when you go to court. But remember, your goal is to go home. And we, we have a lot of good police officers out there between the city, county, state, UT, everybody. There's a lot of good officers out there. We make a lot of contacts with citizens every year that we don't have a problem with. <laughs> it's the few of us that make bad contacts and bad stops that create the problem for all of us. It's just like in any type of situation, any type of profession. Uh, <clears throat> I teach and I talk to a lot of church groups. I was at the fair uh, when the TV and a fair was here, and two little kids coming to me. They were maybe four. And the first thing they looked at me and said, I remember you. You spoke to us at, at our church. And I said, what do you remember? I remember you said to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And they were four. And apparently, they've never been told that before. So the thing I want to stress to you all, once you stop, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I don't care what they say to you. If they say, I don't like that green hat you're wearing, yes, sir. <laughs> 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 yes, ma'am. That's, that's, that's how you respond, because your primary goal is to do what? 
Go home. Go home. Uh, no, you get to keep that. I, I, I've heard that, but I thought that it was important for you to hear that. If you don't remember <coughs> anything else today, we're going to remember two words. Our goal is to go home. go home. And now you know how to get to go home, right? And the word is yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm, I don't have a bag. All right. But, <laughs> but uh, so that, and, and I, I think that it really does... Uh, um, align with what Chief Troy said in that there has to be respect on both sides. And uh, that's the thing that we want to remember. We talked, uh, we talked about um, uh, uh, what has happened and the new awareness about us as citizen rights to have cameras and everything, but what has changed within your two uh, departments? I'm going back to originally why we're here, Post Ferguson. We, t we talked about, you know, you can be credentialed, but credentials have to be enforced. And you can have, uh, you can have uh, good officers with just a few that are crossing the boundaries. But what changed within your uh, uh, particular uh, uh, agencies post-Ferguson? What impact did that have on you, especially in the light of looking at diverse populations? I'll probably speak for Nate when I say that we both probably initially said, wow, I'm glad that's not us. Um, but, but it's not us, I think, f for reasons that, and I think that we should be proud of, uh, that, that, uh, that our community has not gotten to that point, um, thankfully. Uh, as far as, you know, each situation that, one of the things that I like to do is each situation that I see that brings negativity toward my profession, which I, I tend to take personally, and I, I, I hope and believe that that's a good thing. Uh, but each situation that I look at, uh, I, I, I always seem to fall back to my policy. Would my policy allow that? And if so, is that correct? Or is that something that we need to address? Uh, that officer's actions, if that was my officer, what what would happen? What would I do? What steps would I take? What, you know, what corrective actions would I take? Um, all those things that I look at in terms of um, equipment, technology. Are, 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 is, there, is there an application or a piece of technology out there that would help deter or, 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 or avoid a similar situation? Uh, so those are all things that, that I look at. Um, one issue you, you hadn't mentioned, um, the, the officer uh, with the University of Cincinnati that shot the, the gentleman a uh, mile off of campus, that obviously forced us to, to take another look at our MOU with the city, at what our jurisdiction is, do our people know what our jurisdiction is, and have that conversation with our officers. What is your jurisdiction? And what gives you the authority to be in this area? And then look at the action itself, which quite honestly, I, you know, I, I, I've not seen everything I'm sure that there is. I've read the report, but I saw the same thing you all saw in the news media, and my instant reaction was, I, I can't justify that. And, and you know, so I kind of sat back and said, well, it'll be interesting to see if someone tries to justify that, w what information do they have that I'm, I'm not seeing? Um, but any of these situations that we see, that, that particularly those that draw a lot of media attention, and a lot of them that ha happen locally that we don't see media attention on, uh, always cause us to go back and reevaluate our policies, our procedures, uh, our people. You, you asked what do we do differently now post-Ferguson. I think the biggest thing that we do differently now is, is our officers are more aware that you all are aware that you all are recording everything, that the officers are always on videotape, no matter wh where they are or what they're doing. Um, the awareness has really, really changed on it. You know, when you, when you think about awareness and are we doing the right thing as police officers? Who do we work for? We work for you. And then that's something that's it's very difficult for officers to grasp because, you know, officers pay taxes too, so we work for ourselves. And most of us don't like to be told from somebody, oh, you work for me. So that, that creates animosity when, when that happens. Um, 
So I, after that, I think the awareness has changed. As far as the video cameras are going in the car, the KPD has always had video cameras. So since the late 1990s, we've had video cameras in the car. And they run all the time. They run on every stop. Uh, and we keep the tapes. We have a lot of tapes. So videotaping is not new to, to us. Um, it's, it's not new for us or to us. You coming up with a camera, recording a, a stop, that's not new to us either. Does it agitate some people? It probably can. But can you do that legally? Sure, videotape all you want to. Now I think some of the officers started getting that phone, not videotaping you, or videotaping back. So everybody's <laughs> videotaping. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, that's fine. But, but keep in mind when you do videotape, you talk about the awareness now, everyone want to shoot it, make sure that you, you stay in your distance because remember that if the officer is involved in a confrontation with somebody, he or she don't know if you are a friend of that person is going to jump on the officer to try to defend the, the suspect who's been arrested or the person who's there in the confrontation with. You don't know. Um, so, so keep in mind of that. And keep in mind, know, know the law. And I, I get those videotapes all the time, and somebody, you've seen them on Facebook, and you've seen them on YouTube. Someone comes up with a videotape, and they say, I know the law. You, can, you can't tell me what to do, and I can stand here. It's, it's a free uh, sidewalk, and I can stand here. I can do this, and I can talk. <clears throat> really, really know what the law says, because if you ever research the law that governs under disorderly conduct, what does it say? And I, I'll let you research that and get back with me on what, <laughs> what did the law say about being disorderly? What does that really mean? Um, so as far as Post Ferguson is concerned now, it, it, may, it has made the officers more aware uh, of their surroundings, more aware that there have been videotapes, more aware that you're there, and make you more aware that when something happened, pull out your phone and start videotaping it. Um, okay, that's just the way we're going. Every social media now has taken over everything, and we are, we are embracing that. I think for the most part, the officers have embraced it because the officers are, are young. Uh, they participate in social media. They know how it works. So that doesn't fear them, don't, don't scare them at all. They have, they have no fear in that at all. Um, and most of our officers, especially within the state here, are trained, so we know what we can and cannot do. Keep in mind, we are human, and we do make mistakes. Across the country, we saw that when uh, there is a there's disparity uh, in the representation on uh, police forces, both on campuses and in communities, of a total lack of uh, diversity as reflected in their communities. So we won't talk about the United States. We're gonna. We're going to do our Google Map thing, and we're going to come way down and zoom in just on, just on us. So what are uh, each one of your uh, respective departments doing to uh, increase the diversity of the officers on your force? That's a very, very good question. We have been working to improve our diversity for the last 30 years that Nate's been there. And we've not done a very good job at it, in my opinion. We still have a long ways to go. We still need to represent the community. Uh, and when I say represent the community, that's the total community, from the Latino community to the Asian community, African-American community, all walks of life. We need to represent them there. It's very difficult for people to go into a different community culturally and police it. Use a prime example for Caucasians to go into black communities and police it like a person of color would police that community. It's a little bit difficult because of the cultural differences. That doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just a, it's just a little bit more difficult. Um, for Nate to go into a <clears throat> very southern small county and become sheriff of like Union County would be very difficult for Nate to do that, to achieve that goal. For those of you who are around this area, you know what Union County is. It's not a county that's very diverse in African Americans. Um, so just keep, keep that in mind. And that's something we try to train for in the academy. But can we train for all of that? No. Uh, we have to learn and we have to train and talk to each other about each culture is different. Don't matter what it is. What you do in your culture is how you do it. And it's fine. And we need to have that understanding in it. So we need to have more people who look like the, the community on the police force, because the police force is very, very critical to survival in the, in, in, for any city, for any, any community. Chief Troy? That's a million dollar question. Okay, pay up. Um, 
no one in this room would be happier to increase the diversity in their department than me. Uh, trust me in that. We reach out to uh, nearly every uh, diverse group that we can in in uh, in the Knoxville community. Um, uh, when we have openings in our department and let them know that we're going to be taking uh, applications. Unfortunately, when it comes down to time to, to start selecting uh, people and testing people for positions, uh, we get far and few uh, diverse applicants, which is unfortunate. One of the, one of the reasons, I believe, and, and, and this isn't a cop-out, so to speak, but uh, we are, UT Police Department is ac actually the lowest paid police department in our geographic region, um, and by far, quite honestly. Every department that you'll probably talk to um, nationwide is gonna tell you that one of, the, one of the things they would like to do is increase the diversity in their department. If they're worth their salt, that's what they wanna do. And yet, if I'm an applicant, and I happen to be an African-American applicant, am I gonna apply at this department that pays this much, or am I going to apply at that department that pays that much? So we're working to try and, 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 and bridge that gap, but, uh, but thus far we, we are so much lower that I just, I, I fear that we're not a very good uh, target for someone that, that wants to join law enforcement, uh, who's, who's probably aggressively being pursued for those jobs, and yet you look at the pay discre uh, discrepancy and, and decide to move on somewhere else. You're going to have to look for balls for life. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Those are the ones. We have three minutes, and I want to open this up to the students. Any questions for any of our panelists? Anything that you're dying to contribute? Now is the time we, we want to hear from you. Anyone? Anyone? You learned it all. You learned it all. Okay. Uh, thank you to Dean Worth and uh, the college for having a timely uh, and important uh, conversation. Thank you to our panelists. Let me just uh, give uh, my nickel's worth. This is the beginning of a conversation for you. We are uh, not in the best of times, but we are not in the worst of times. And your participation in these times will determine how we go forward. Your participation as a citizen is very important. Thank you for coming and be sure and fill out your evaluation form.